The Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions will please come to order. <laughs> Senator Murray and I will each have an opening statement, and then we'll introduce the witnesses. After the witnesses' testimony, senators will each have five minutes of, of questions. Uh, it wasn't long ago when I was a boy that I remember the terror in the hearts of parents that their children might contract polio. I had classmates who lived in iron lungs. Uh, the majority leader of the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell, contracted polio when he was very young. As a poignant story about his mother, didn't know what to do, but she took him to Warm Springs because that's where President Roosevelt went. And for a long period of time, when he was two and three years old, she massaged his legs several hours a day, which is hard to imagine if you remember toddlers. Um, and that's why he's able to walk today. Thousands of others are not so lucky. Following the introduction of a vaccine in 1955, polio was eliminated in the United States in 1979, and since then, from every country in the world except three. Polio is just one of the diseases we have eradicated in the United States thanks to vaccine. Before the vaccine for measles was developed, up to four million Americans each year contracted the highly contagious airborne virus. In 2000, the D Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, declared measles eliminated from the United States. And in 1980, smallpox was declared eradicated from the world by the CDC and the World Health Organization. These stories of polio and measles and small park small small parks are a remarkable demonstration of what modern medicine can accomplish in the lives of millions of people in our country and in the world four years ago this committee held a hearing on vaccines that was following the 2014 outbreak of measles the worst outbreak since the disease was declared eliminated in 2000 and even though 91 percent of americans had been vaccinated for measles in 2017. According to the CDC, we continue to see outbreaks of this preventable disease because there are pockets in the United States that have low vaccination rates. Last year, there were 372 cases of measles, the second highest number since 2000. So far this year, there have been 159 cases reported and outbreaks confirmed in Washington State, New York, Texas, and Illinois. We know some Americans are hesitant about vaccines. So today I want to stress the importance of vaccines. Not only has the Food and Drug Administration found them to be safe, but vaccines save lives. Vaccines have been so successful that until recently, Americans have lived without fear of getting measles, polio, or rubella. We've made significant strides in improving vaccination rates. In 2009, about 44% of Americans had received vaccines for seven preventable diseases, all of which I'll now try to pronounce. Diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella, haemophilus, influenza type B, hepatitis B, chicken pox, and pneumococcal, according to the CDC. Today, over 70% of Americans are vaccinated against all seven of these diseases. Vaccines protect not only those who've been vaccinated, but the larger community. This is called herd immunity. There are some young people who cannot be vaccinated. They're too young, or they have a weak immune system because of a genetic disorder, or they're taking medicine that compromises their immune system, like cancer treatment. Vaccines protect those who cannot be vaccinated by preventing the spread of disease. However, low immunization rates can destroy a community's herd immunity. While the overall vaccination rate nationwide is high enough to create this herd immunity, certain areas, the pockets of the country where vaccination rates are low, are vulnerable to outbreaks. There's a lot of misleading and incorrect information about vaccines that circulates online throughout social media. Here's what I'd like for parents in Tennessee to know, parents in Washington, parents in Texas, everywhere in the country. Vaccines are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. They meet the Food and Drug Administration's gold standard of safety. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices makes recommendations on the use of vaccines in our country and annual child and adult vaccine schedules. 
This advisory committee is made up of medical doctors and public health professionals from medical schools, hospitals, and professional medical organizations from around the country. They're among the best our country has to offer. They have dedicated their lives to helping others. These recommendations are reviewed and approved by the CDC director and are available on the CDC website. There's nothing secret about any of this science, and countless studies have shown that vaccines are safe. Internet fraudsters who claim that vaccines are not safe are preying on the unfounded fears and daily struggles of parents, and they're creating a public health hazard that is entirely preventable. It's important for those who have questions about vaccines, especially parents, to speak with a reputable health provider. As with many topics, just because you found it on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. The science is sound, vaccines save lives, the lives of those who receive vaccines, and the lives of those who are too young or vulnerable to be immunized. Before I turn this over to Senator Murray, I want to add that the National Child Heen Vaccine Injury Act of 1986 required the Department of Health and Human Services to submit a report to Congress within two years after the legislation was signed into law. The Help Committee has received two reports from the Department submitted to Congress May 4, 1988 and July 21, 1989. I ask consent that the reports be submitted to the committee record so they can be more accessible to the public. Senator Murray. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Washington State and several other states grapple with measles outbreaks, this issue could not be more timely. I remember in 2000 when measles was officially eliminated from the United States and what welcome news that was for families across this country. And I remember the effort, years of efforts that actually led to that victory. Before the vaccine was available, measles outbreaks used to spread through communities like wildfire. If you were old enough to drive, odds were you'd already had measles. But today, vaccines that protect against measles have been in use for over 50 years. Like other vaccines, we know the vaccine is safe, it's effective, and it saves lives. Which is why today a generation of students are starting college, almost none of whom had to worry about a measles outbreak at school. It also means a generation of new parents may not appreciate just how dangerous measles is. Before introduction of the measles vaccine and widespread vaccination, millions of people caught measles annually, meaning thousands were hospitalized, hundreds of people died, mostly children under five years old. But measles isn't just deadly. It's also one of the world's most contagious diseases. It is easily transmitted through coughing and sneezing. It can linger in the air and on infected services for two hours. It is already contagious four days before an infected person develops a rash and then another four days after. Nine out of 10 unvaccinated people exposed to measles catch it. That's why the measles vaccine is so important in providing protection. Experts say in order to establish herd immunity against me measles, in order to prevent an outbreak from occurring within a community, at least 95% of people should be vaccinated. Meeting that threshold is crucial to protect people who are unable to get vaccinated, infants, those with certain medical conditions. Unfortunately, while the national vaccination rate remains high, in communities across the country, we are falling behind. Vaccine coverage rates are declining in certain areas, contributing to the rise in preventable outbreaks, like in Clark County, Washington, where public health officials continue to respond to a measles outbreak. The immunization rate among children in that community is less than 70 percent, far below what is needed to keep families safe. The result is a true public health emergency, over 70 confirmed cases and counting. And the majority of cases have affected children under 10 years old who are unvaccinated. Each case isn't a concern for, just a concern for family members who are worried about their loved ones who are seriously sick. It is a threat to neighbors and communities left struggling to get an incredibly contagious disease under control. It's a terror for parents with newborns who cannot yet get vaccinated and a strain on our public health system as hundreds of staff in Washington State are pulled from critical public health roles to respond to this crisis. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention stretches to support the response to outbreaks in Washington and several other states. 
Measles isn't the only disease that deserves our attention amid, amid slipping vaccination rates. Diseases like the chair, chairman mentioned, mumps, pertussis, or whooping cough are also cause for concern. These outbreaks are a clear sign we've had to do more to address vaccine hesitancy and make sure parents have the facts they need to understand the science. Vaccines are safe and effective and life-saving. Parents across the country want to do what is best for their families to keep them safe, which is why they need to be armed with knowledge about the importance of vaccination and why we need research into vaccine communication tools and strategies to help us better educate people to address vaccine hesitancy and build vaccine confidence. We also need to understand the roles social media and online misinformation play in spreading dangerous rumors and falsehoods. And we need to better prepare the full spectrum of healthcare providers who are often the professionals people trust most to counter vaccine hesitancy and promote vaccination. That's important not only for parents, but also for expectant parents who may already be deciding whether or not they plan to vaccinate and for promoting adult vaccines and encouraging people to protect themselves and others throughout their lives. I look forward today to hearing from Dr. Wiesman about how Washington State is working now to get parents reliable information about the importance of vaccination and from all of our witnesses who are here today about how the federal government and other partners can promote vaccines and prevent the spread of misinformation. And while we are now fighting multiple measles outbreaks, it's important we also educate people on the HPV vaccine's role in preventing sexually transmitted diseases and lowering cancer risks, the flu vaccine, particularly on the heels of one of the most deadly flu seasons in years, the whooping cough vaccine, especially for those around infants who are particularly susceptible to the disease, and the value of other recommended vaccines. We also need to make sure we are approaching the public health challenges like this from a global perspective because we know diseases are not stopped by borders or walls or bans. They are stopped by doctors and nurses and vaccines and public health awareness. And they're stopped by strong investments in public health systems here at home and abroad. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's certainly the case here. A dose of MMR vaccine covering measles, mumps, and rubella is about $20. Meanwhile, Washington State has spent over a million dollars already addressing the current measles outbreak. Investing in prevention isn't just more effective at keeping our families and communities healthy, it is more affordable as well. The Vaccines for Children program is another great example of this. Over 25 years now, it has helped kids in low-income families get shots at no cost. It has saved $1.6 trillion, prevented 380 million illnesses, and saved 860,000 lives. That's more people than live in Seattle. So I hope we can work together in a bipartisan way to build on programs like this with strong steps to help address public health crises and better yet, to prevent them from happening in the first place. And I'm glad to have this opportunity to learn more about how we can do that and to consider how to make sure people across the country understand that vaccines are safe and effective to keep their families and their community healthy. And Mr. Chairman, um, I would ask that a letter from the National Association of County and City Health Officials be submitted for the record. It speaks to the important role of our local health departments across the country in responding to vaccine preventable disease outbreaks and other emergency health threats. So ordered. Thank you, <coughs> Senator Murray. <clears throat> we'll now introduce our witnesses. Each one of you will have up to five minutes for questions and answers. I'll ask the senators. Let's try to keep the questions and answers within the five-minute period of time so everyone can have a chance to participate. Uh, Senator Murray will introduce the first witness. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. From my home state of Washington, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John Wiesman. Dr. Wiesman was appointed as Washington State Secretary of Health back in 2013, and his service there is just the latest in a 22-year career working to keep our families and communities healthy. Throughout his career, he's worked at four different health departments, including Clark County Public Health in Vancouver, which is the current front line of our measles outbreak in our state. 
And Dr. Wiesman, I know some of my colleagues on the committee will appreciate learning that before you came to my state to work in our public health system, you got your education in theirs, receiving your bachelor's degree in Wisconsin, uh, your master's in Connecticut, and your PhD in North Carolina. I'm glad we have you now in Washington State working to help keep our families safe and healthy and respond to public health threats as we currently are. And I appreciate so much you coming out all the way out here from our other Washington. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Isaacson, will you introduce our second witness? Thank you very much, Chair Chairman Alexander. I'm very pleased to introduce to the committee and everyone here today, Dr. Saad Omer, and I believe that's the right pronunciation. Close. Close enough, good. Well, I'm, mine's Isaacson, so I just want to make sure we got it right. We're very delighted to have him here today as an expert on the subject we're discussing. Dr. Omer is William H. Foggy, Professor of Global Health and Professor of Epidemi Epidemiology and Pediatrics at Emory University School of Public Health and Medicine. Dr. Omer also works in the Emory Vaccine Center, making him a well-qualified witness for today's hearing. His research includes studies in the United States and internationally, including clinical and field trials to estimate the efficacy of influenza, polio, measles, and other vaccinations. Dr. Omer has published approximately 250 papers in peer review journals and has served on several uh, respected advisory committees and panels, including the U.S. National Vaccine Advisory Committee. He has also men mentored over 100 junior faculty members, clinical and research postdoctoral fellows, and PhD and other graduate students, playing an important role in ensuring that the pipeline of qualified scientists is well stocked in the United States of America. Dr. O'Mara, welcome to the committee today. We're, we're here for your expertise. <clears throat> we appreciate your testimony, and go Emory. <laughs> Thank you, Senator uh, Isaacson. Third, we'll hear from Dr. Jonathan McCullers. He's chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, serves as pediatrician in chief at the remarkable Le Bonner Children's Hospital in Memphis, Received his medical degree and completed his internship and residency at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. In 1999, he was named a St. Jude Scholar in the Physician Scientist Development Program and joined the St. Jude faculty in the Department of Infectious Diseases, where he spent 13 years managing a translational research lab studying influenza viruses and bacterial pneumonia. In 2012, he joined Le Bonner. He's published more than 150 peer review articles. Fourth, John Boyle. He's president and CEO of the Immune Deficiency Foundation in Towson, Maryland, which is focused on meeting the needs of people with primary immunodeficiency disease. Prior to joining the foundation, he worked for the Children's National Medical Center and the Platelet Disorders Support Association. <clears throat> he received his Bachelor of Science from Boston University, a Master in Nonprofit Management from Notre Dame of Maryland University. Finally, we welcome Ethan Lindenberger. Mr. Lindenberger is currently a student at Norwalk High School in Norwalk, Ohio. He's here to share his experience seeking out information about vaccines and making decisions about whether or not to become vaccinated. Welcome again to all our witnesses. Dr. Wiseman, let's begin with you. Great. Chairman Alexander. Dr. Rank Wiseman, excuse me. Very good. That's good. Chairman Alexander, Ranking Member Murray, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss public health work in protecting people from vaccine-preventable diseases. Vaccines are safe, effective, and the best protection we have against serious preventable diseases like measles. Vaccinating children in the United States has saved millions of lives, increased expectancy, and saved our society trillions of dollars. My mission as Washington's Secretary of Health is to protect and promote the health of all its people and ensure our public policy is based on best available science. I want to speak directly to the parents who have children with serious health issues and who have been attending our hearings in Washington State and are watching this hearing today. I see your pain and your desire for answers to your children's health issues. Your mission to protect and promote the health of your children is one we share. While the science is clear that vaccines do not cause autism, we do need to better understand its causes. We need to develop together affected families, scientists, and public health officials research agendas to get the answers we need. State, territorial, and tribal local public health agencies are on the front lines. 
In Washington State, we provide all recommended vaccines without charge to all children under the age of 19. We provide an electronic immunization information system for healthcare providers to track vaccine dose schedules, provide reminders when patients are overdue, and measure immunization rates. We help parents make informed decisions by sending them the information they need to keep children healthy and publish plain talk about childhood immunization. And we assist school nurses by giving them access to the electronic immunization records. As of yesterday, Washington State's measles outbreak had 71 cases, plus four cases associated with our outbreak in Oregon and one in Georgia. Containing a measles outbreak takes a whole community response led by governmental public health. The moment a suspected case is reported, disease investigators interview that person to determine when they were infectious, who they were in close contact with, and what public spaces they visited. If still infectious, the health officer orders them to isolate themselves so they don't infect others, notifies the public and the, about the, the community about the public places that they were uh, in when they were infectious, and stands up a call center to handle questions. We also reach out to individuals who were in close contact with the patient. If they are unvaccinated and without symptoms, we ask them to quarantine themselves for up to 21 days. That's how long it can take to develop symptoms. And we monitor them so that we quickly know if they develop measles. If they show symptoms, we get them to a healthcare provider and obtain samples to test for measles. And if they have measles, we start the investigation process all over again. This is a staff and time intensive activity and is highly disruptive to people's lives. Responding to this preventable outbreak has cost over $1 million and required the work of more than 200 individuals. So what do we need from the federal government? First, we need sustained, predictable, and increased federal funding. Congress must prioritize public health and support the prevention and public health fund. We are constantly reacting to crises rather than working to prevent them. The Association of State and Territorial Health Officials and over 80 organizations are asking you to raise the CDC budget by 22% by FY22. This will immediately bolster prevention services, save lives, and reduce health care cost. Second, our response to this outbreak has been benefited greatly from the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, so thank you. The Public Health Emergency Preparedness Cooperative Agreement and the hospital preparedness programs authorized by this law are currently funded $400 million below funding levels in the 2000s. More robust funding is needed, and I strongly urge you to quickly reauthorize POPRA because many of the authorizations expired last year. Third, the 317 immunization program has been flat funded for 10 years. Without increased funding, we cannot afford to develop new ways to reach parents with immunization information, nor maintain our electronic immunization systems. Fourth, we need federal leadership for a national vaccine campaign spearheaded by CDC in partnership with states that counter the anti-vaccine messages, similar to the successful Truth Tobacco Prevention Campaign. We have lost much ground. Urgent action is necessary. Everyone has a right to live in a community free of vaccine preventable diseases. To make this a reality, we must continue to invest in and strengthen our public health system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wiesman. Dr. Omer. Thanks for the, thanks for the opportunity uh, for me to talk about vaccines in this forum. Um, elimination of endemic measles transmission uh, from the U.S. in 2000 is a significant public health success. Since then, most of the cases have occurred through U.S. travelers going outside and bringing it back. Uh, while recent measles outbreaks have been contained, the frequency and size of these outbreaks have been particularly al alarming for those of us who follow these trends. Um, the rest of this testimony will be focused on answering some of the salient questions that have been coming up. So the first question is, why haven't we seen a national level outbreak in the U.S.? And we cannot take this for granted. Our countries with similar development status, like Germany, France, and, and Italy, specifically more recently, have had national level outbreaks. And it is not um, a coincidence that we haven't seen similar national outbreaks, and there are several reasons for it. First of all, our laws, school level mandates work, and they work by changing the balance of convenience. In most states, they, they work by changing the balance of convenience for vaccination compared to non-vaccination, by having uh, physician counseling, or by uh, having um, a, a, a 
parents go through uh, a, a video with, that talks about vaccines and, and the benefits of vaccines, et cetera. And the third thing is, in our country, medical societies like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Infectious Disease Society of America have been very prominent in vaccine advocacy. And, um, and it is important because it's based on the fact that uh, physicians are the most trusted source of vaccine information. Uh, so we have talked about uh, the role measles has uh, played in uh, vaccine refusal has played in these outbreaks. And I will just give a few numbers. For example, uh, more than half of the cases since um, the elimination have been unvaccinated and approximately 70% of them are unvaccinated due to vaccine refusal or non-medical exemptions. So there is a contribution of uh, vaccine refusal in our epidemiology of measles. And vaccine mandates have been an uh, effective tool in uh, changing that balance of convenience that I was talking about. But that's a state level issue. I will focus on some of the things the federal government can do. In my written testimony, I have provided a few more details on that specific issue, and I'd be happy to answer questions. So there are a few things the federal government can do. First, um, consider making vaccine counseling reimbursable. And I have worked on vaccine research in multiple countries and multiple states in the US. There are a lot of local uh, factors that are specific, but there's one constant. Vaccine provi uh, healthcare providers, specifically physicians, are the most trusted source of vaccine information, amongst, even amongst those who are a little bit skeptical of vaccines. So uh, we need to use that tool more effectively. On the, on the practical side, physicians do not have the time to properly counsel patients using evidence-based approaches. And part of the reason, not the, uh, all of the reason, is the fact that this is not reimbursable. So, so uh, physicians lose money on, on this kind of important public health education. We should, as a country, the second point is, invest in high quality vaccine acceptance and communications research. And I often say that if we don't accept half-baked vaccine development science, and we don't. Uh, there is, the you know, FDA goes through evaluation of the science uh, from trials and basic sciences, et cetera. We should not be accepting of half-baked vaccine communications and behavioral science. And, and we have precedent in this country. For example, NIH's cancer prevention initiatives are, um, are, are a gold standard in these kinds of uh, interventions and evidence-based uh, communication strategies. Uh, NAIDs, the National Institute for um, uh, um, uh, Immunology and uh, uh, of oh, sorry National Institute for Infection uh, and Allergy um, has they have had uh, very effective intervention development in the area of uh, HIV AIDS behavior. So we have that precedent in this country, and we need to invest in in actual research. And before we develop evidence, while we develop evidence, there is an existing blueprint of interventions that the National Vaccine Advisory Committee put together. And unfortunately, not all of its interventions and its recommendations have been implemented. So that is ready to be implemented. And CDC plays this important role in fighting these fires, working with state and local health departments, which is somewhat unique in the developed world. So we need to support their mission. And we should continue to prioritize vaccine safety research. And, and I would want to thank you for bipartisan and consistent support for vaccines, because that matters. And that shows that there is broad societal support for vaccines. And, and those of us who work to protect children from uh, these infectious diseases really appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Omer. Uh, Dr. McCullers, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Alexander, Ranking Member Murray, other members of the committee. My name is John McCullers. I'm the Chair of Pediatrics at the University of Tennessee and the Pediatrician-in-Chief at Labonner Children's Hospital in Memphis. As someone who has devoted his career to the child health sphere, I truly believe there is no more precious resource than our children, and they should be protected by all means available to us. They really are the future of this nation. The Childhood Vaccination Program in the United States has proven to be one of the most powerful public health achievements in our history. In the first half of the 20th century, there were more than 1 million infections and more than 10,000 deaths every year in this country from diseases which are now preventable by childhood vaccines. Measles alone caused more than a half million illnesses every year. 
Measles is a highly contagious viral respiratory disease characterized by fever, cough, sore throat, and a rash. It is a very dangerous disease. About one in a thousand infected persons develop encephalitis, an infection of the brain. One in a thousand develops severe pneumonia, and about half of those with those severe complications die. There is no specific treatment for measles, so vaccination is the only means of preventing these outcomes. With the introduction of a safe and effective vaccine for measles in 1963 and improved public health efforts to see that nearly every child received it, new cases of measles arising in the United States were entirely eliminated by the year 2000. Unfortunately, the issues of vaccine opposition and vaccine hesitancy are now impairing our ability to effectively ensure coverage aided by state laws that make it easier to avoid vaccination. The last decade has brought numerous outbreaks to the United States, including several that are ongoing at present. These outbreaks are strongly linked to vaccine refusal and in particular to clustering of unvaccinated individuals in specific communities or regions. This problem is not limited to the United States, however. Countries worldwide are dealing with similar outbreaks. As a single example for the committee, there were zero cases of measles in Brazil in 2017, but more than 10,000 cases occurred on a countrywide level in 2018 when infected travelers brought measles into that country. The vaccine against measles is very safe and very effective. One dose provides complete protection in about 93% of individuals, while a second dose raises that level of protection to 97%. Very few side effects occur. About one in 10 children experience fever for one to two days after vaccination, and about one in 3,000 to one in 4,000 have a simple seizure associated with fever with no lasting effects. Allergic reactions are very rare and typically very mild. When compared to the outcomes of the disease itself, it's easy to see why doctors and public health officials universally recommend on time and complete vaccination. Unfortunately, vaccine refusal is high and getting worse in many states. This issue is comp complicated by the variety of state policies regarding exemption from vaccination and the methods of counseling about vaccines. The rate of parents claiming non-medical exemptions compared uh, is about two and a half times higher in states that allow both religious and philosophical objection. Evidence of seeing that multiple pathways for exemption really worsens this problem. Social media is now driving a new phenomenon somewhat distinct from vaccine opposition termed vaccine hesitancy. When parents get much of their information about health care issues such as vaccines from the internet or from social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook, reading uninformed opinions and the absence of accurate information can lead to really understandable concern and confusion in these parents. They may be hesitant to get their children vaccinated without being provided with more information. The role of the pediatrician is very important, therefore, with these families. We must do a better job of communicating at many levels, but particularly at the point of contact at the well-child visit when vaccination should take place. About half of the time when counseled appropriately, parents with vaccine hesitancy will agree to have their children vaccinated on time. And the other half, little seems to help at that stage, so the solution must be earlier, either in the form of policy or broader educational efforts. In closing, I'd like to thank the committee for addressing this important issue. Vaccine refusal is one of the growing public health threats of our time. If we continue to allow non-medical exemptions to vaccination, the rates of vaccine will continue to fall. More outbreaks will undoubtedly follow. As a leader at a children's hospital, I have a unique perspective on this, as children's hospitals are regional and sometimes national resources. Le Bonheur Children's Hospital sits in the corner of Tennessee next to Arkansas and Mississippi. Three, three states all have very different policies for granting exemptions to, to vaccines, which creates a tremendous problem for us and a threat to the children we serve, many of whom are too young to be vaccinated or immunocompromised and more prone to severe diseases. I urge the committee to consider solutions that will both harmonize public health policy in this area and will also protect children as they grow up to become the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCullers. Mr. Boyle, welcome. Chairman Alexander, Ranking Member Murray, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me uh, here to testify on the importance of herd immunity, or community immunity as we like to say, for vaccine preventable diseases. My name is John Boyle and I am the President and CEO of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, a not-for-profit patient organization that represents people with primary immunodeficiency diseases, or PI. Primary immunodeficiency diseases are a group of more than 350 rare and chronic disorders in which parts of the body's immune system are either missing or uh, functioning improperly. 
There's an estimated 250,000 people diagnosed with PI in the U.S. alone. That's about 1 in 1,200 of your constituents. These disorders are caused by genetic defects and are not contagious. Now, there's a variety between the different forms of PI, but one thing unites all of us. We are immunocompromised, meaning that we are potentially vulnerable to even common viruses and bacteria. Now, I have a form of PI known as X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, or XLA. I was diagnosed with it when I was six months old, when a respiratory infection nearly killed me. In short, I don't produce antibodies. But I'm able to be here with you today because I receive weekly infusions of antibodies from other people through a blood plasma product called immunoglobulin, or Ig. These infusions give me back some of what I'm missing, but I'm still susceptible to infections. Now, because I was diagnosed early and I receive Ig therapy, my health is better than most others with PI. However, a simple cold can wreak havoc with me or many other members of our community. We're incredibly vulnerable to communicable illnesses. Now, for some members of our community, infections are truly a life and death matter. I think all of you probably remember David Vetter, uh, affectionately known as the boy in the, the plastic bubble, uh, who was born with severe combined immune deficiency, or SCID. Children diagnosed with SCID, XLA, or any other form of PI face multiple challenges with simple everyday pathogens. Now, exposing these children to something as severe as measles could be life-threatening. Parents and communities where vaccine use is being questioned are afraid to send their children outside. They're afraid because they know the history, the science, and the math, and they know the stakes. If people stop vaccinating, the safety net of community immunity will fall, and their children will be among the first casualties. Now, of course, this does not just affect children, it affects adults too. While there's now newborn screening for SCID, most members of our community go years or even decades with serious and recurrent infections without knowing that they have a compromised immune system. And I'm particularly concerned for the health of this segment of our community, the undiagnosed. If community immunity fails, they don't even know that they need to take precautions. Those of us who know that we have PI do what we can to avoid exposure to uh, infections but the undiagnosed lack this basic knowledge and are even more at risk. Now, the reason that all of us are so dependent on community immunity and the PI community is that vaccines do not work with most of us who have forms of PI. Our systems either don't remember the pathogens or we physically can't create the antibodies. A further complication is that there are some vaccines that are actually dangerous to us, live vaccines. As a result, those in the field of immunology have studied this issue thoroughly to produce evidence-based guidelines to best safeguard those of us with PI. An article that I shared with the committee discusses the issues surrounding which vaccines are either indicated or not, but it also addresses the growing neglect of societal adherence to routine vaccinations, what we're here talking about today. It states how important it is for family members and then those around patients with immune deficiencies to receive all available standard immunizations in order to protect the family member who has PI. Now, in closing, let me say this. My life, along with the lives of hundreds of thousands of others who are immunocompromised, depend on community immunity. We depend on vaccines. I understand the concern that some new, patient, new parents have, particularly given the misinformation on social media. But that fear can override the facts. History has shown us that vaccines work. Science has shown us that vaccines are necessary. And mathematics has shown us that the odds of children having a healthy life are magnitudes greater if they've had their vaccines. The current decline in vaccine usage is literally bringing back plagues of the past. While those of us who are immunocompromised will suffer first and suffer more, the loss of community immunity is a threat to all of us. We need to band together to dispel the myths, combat misinformation campaigns, and help ensure that measles and other vaccine-preventable diseases are once again put in their place in history books and not in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Mr. Lindenberger, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Alexander, Senator Murray, and distinguished committee members the opportunity to speak today. Uh, good morning, everyone. As uh, was stated, my name is Ethan Lindenberger, and I'm a senior at Norwalk High School. And my mother is an anti-vax advocate that believes vaccines cause autism, brain damage, and do not benefit 
the Health and Safety Society, despite the fact such opinions have been debunked numerous times by the scientific community. I went my entire life without numerous vaccines against diseases uh, such as measles, chicken pox, or even polio. However, in December 2018, I began catching up on my missed immunizations, despite my mother's disapproval. Um, eventually leading to, to this story and being able to speak here today, and I'm very happy for that, so thank you. Now, to understand why I've come here and what I really want to talk about, I have to share some details about my, my home life and my upbringing. Um, I grew up understanding my mother's beliefs that vaccines are dangerous, and she would speak openly about these views. Both online and in person, she would voice her concerns, and these beliefs were met with strong criticism. Over the course of my life, seeds of doubts were planted and questions arose because of the, the backlash my mother would receive, but over time, that really didn't lead anywhere. Now, it's important to understand that as I approached high school and began to critically think for myself, I saw that the information in defense of vaccines outweighed the concerns heavily. Um, I began leading debate clubs in my school and pursuing truth above all else, and I realized one certain quality to debates and to conversations in general when it comes to controversial discussions, which is that there seems to always be two sides to a discussion. Um, there always seems to be a counterclaim or a rebuttal and always something to strike back with in terms of debate. Though this may seem true in all instances, this is not true for the vaccine debate, and I approached I approach my mother with this concern that she was incorrect. Um, I approached my mother numerous times uh, trying to explain that vaccines are safe and that my family should be vaccinated. Um, approaching even with articles in the CDC, explicitly claiming that ideas that vaccines cause autism and extremely dangerous consequences were incorrect. In one such instance where I approached my mother with information from the CDC that claimed vaccines do not cause autism, she responded with, that's what they want you to think. Uh, skepticism and worry were taking the forefront in terms of uh, information. Now, Conversations like these reaffirmed that evidence in defense of vaccines was, uh, at least on an anecdotal level, much greater than the deeply rooted misinformation my mother interacted with. And that's what I want to focus on today. Uh, to combat preventable disease outbreaks, information is, in my mind, the forefront of this matter. My mother would turn to anti-vaccine groups online and on social media, looking for her evidence in defense rather than health officials and through credible sources. This may seem to be in malice because of the dangers that not vaccinating imposes, but this is not the case. My mother came in the sense of loving her children and being concerned. Uh, this misinformation spreads, and that's not necessarily um, justifiable, but I carry this knowledge with me that it was uh, with respect and love that I disagreed with my mother. And with the information she provided, I continued to try and explain that it was misinformed. Um, ideas that, again, vaccines cause autism, brain damage, and also that the measles outbreak is of no concern to the society and to America uh, were ideas that were, were uh, pushed by these sources that she would, come, she would go to. And for certain, individual, for certain individuals and organizations that spread this misinformation, they instill fear into the public for their own gain selfishly and do so knowing that their information is incorrect. For my mother, her love, affection, and care as a parent was used to push an agenda to create a false distress. And these sources which spread misinformation should be the primary concern of the American people. Although change is already placed, more strides can be done. Almost 80% of people, according to the Pew Research Center, turn to the internet for health-related questions. I further explain some more statistics and evidence in my written testimony. Now, in terms of what I would like to walk away with today and kind of finalize with, although my mother would turn to very illegitimate sources and sources that did not have peer-reviewed evidence or information, I quickly saw that the evidence and claims for myself were not accurate. And because of that, and because of my healthcare professionals I was able to speak with and the information provided to me, I was able to make a clear, concise, and scientific decision. Approaching this issue with the concern of education and addressing misinformation properly can cause change, as it did for me. Now, although the, the debate around vaccines is not necessarily centered on information and concerns for health and safety, this is why education is important and also misinformation is so dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindenberger, and thank you for coming from Ohio to let us hear what you have to say. Now we'll begin five minute round of questions. I would, we have many senators interested. I would ask the senators to keep the combination of questions and answers within five minutes. Dr. McCullers, you're a, you're a pediatrician in chief 
at one of our country's leading children's hospitals. So your business is to talk uh, every day during your career with lots of parents about their children. So what do you say to parents, to a parent who comes to you in Memphis and said, I've heard on the internet or I've, I've, I've read uh, that vaccines cause autism and I don't want my child to be vaccinated. What do you say to that parent? Well, what we find when we look at this is that parents really have a very you know, complex set of issues that they're concerned about. That's one of them, but there's a lot of other things that they think about and that they bring to us. So it's not one issue that we have to talk about. It's well, but many, what many they, issues. What, I'm, I want to focus on autism. On the autism. What if they say that to you? So what, this was, this was you... a concern that was raised about 20 years ago when there was a fraudulent paper published linking you know, vaccines to autism. Now for that paper was gain. published in the United Kingdom. It was right? published in the United Kingdom. In the a personal, respected journal, is that correct? It was a respected journal. It was a physician who published it, and he was unfortunately paid by a set of attorneys more than 400,000 pounds to falsify information because they were suing the government of England uh, against vaccines. So this was uh, found to be wrong. It was retracted. He lost his medical license. What, but what did the journal do about it? The journal retracted the paper and said it no longer is valid. Mm -hmm. Have the, there been other papers or journals that agreed with that physician's there have not been that agreed with that position. There have been numerous uh, uh, scientific research done in the interim that have shown the opposite, that these vaccines are not linked. And the Institute of Medicine here in the United States, our highest authority on these sort of issues, has declared that they are it's uniformly, basically a closed uh, issue now. As you talk with parents, though, is that persuasive with a mother who's concerned about her child and who's heard that, that uh, vaccines cause autism? I think if there is a rapport with the physician and a res mutual respect there, both for the opinion of the parent, but then also for the position of the physician, you can say things like that and say the evidence is clear. I believe this. You should do this. And they will trust that information. In your opinion, there's no evidence, reputable evidence, that vaccines cause autism? There is, there is absolutely no evidence at this time that vaccines cause autism. Dr. O'Meara, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Dr. Wiesman, do you agree with that? I do. Mr. Boyle, do you agree with that? I do. Mr. Lindenberger? I do. Dr. Wiesman, what about state exemptions? You're a state public health officer, and as a former governor, I generally have a bias toward Washington not telling states what to do on many, on, hmm, except <laughs> Washington. <laughs> with Washington, D.C. not telling states what to do. Uh, Senator Murray's correcting me here. Um, so what advice do you have about state exemptions and the effect on the concern we see today in pockets of measles across the country? Um, I think as we heard earlier that uh, the uh, choice to sort of make exemptions more difficult to get to be as sort of as burdensome as um, sort of not getting the vaccine uh, is incredibly important. Uh, in Washington State, as you know, we have two bills right now that are looking to remove the personal exemptions uh, from uh, vaccine for school entry and for um, uh, child care entry. Um, I think that's one of the tools that uh, we have and that we should be using um, for this. Um, I will also say in Washington State, another problem we have is that about 8% of our kids are out of compliance with school records so that we don't even know if they're vaccinated or um, would like exemptions. And we have to tackle that problem as well, which really is a resource issue for schools and public health. I'm going to stay within my time. Senator Murray. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Wiesman. I, I really appreciate everything um, you and your state and local colleagues are doing on the front lines of this measles outbreak in Washington State, uh, confirming and managing the cases, tracing potential contacts, identifying exposure sites, crafting community messages. There's a lot going on, but it is really scary to imagine how much worse this outbreak would be if not for all the tireless work of so many public health officials on the ground. Um, but we all hope we're not, we are able to not just respond to outbreaks, but also, also focus on preventing them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you how have initiatives like the public-private partnership, VAX Northwest, and your department's proactive communication with parents of young children helped in building uh, confidence? 
Great, thanks. Uh, yes, we do believe that the child profile mailings that go out to parents, um, to kids up to age six, they go out at uh, points in time that are appropriate to the development of the child, um, are incredibly important. It's a trusted source of information, not just on vaccines, but on childhood development. Um, and it's that relationship that we build with parents uh, through that mailing that I think is incredibly important. When I go out to the public and I see a new parent, I'll often ask them, hey, do you get this little mailing from, you know, the health department and they say do we love it it's great information so I think that trusted source is really important um, the private the public private partnership that we have with Vax North West West is actually um, a research initiative to try and best understand how we actually address vaccine hesitancy um, there have been two studies done one looking with healthcare providers on how to best train them around communication uh, with their with their patients um, unfortunately that work didn't find that it made a difference in terms of addressing vaccine hesitancy nor necessarily healthcare providers efficacy um, around um, uh, feeling confident in those conversations the other piece uh, was one with parents and uh, parents who were interested in vaccine advocacy training them on how to have conversations with parents how to uh, share information at PTA meetings etc um, and that did find um, that it increased uh, 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 parents um, knowledge of vaccines and reduced their hesitancy Okay, thank you. And, and Dr. Omer, um, as vaccination rates in some areas drop below levels, we need to keep each other safe. Your research on vaccine hesitancy and, and <coughs> likewise is really critical. Um, and we know that some parents are, are making decisions about whether or not to vaccinate before they even have their child. I want to ask you, what are the implications of some of these early decisions and what have you learned about the key factors that lead some parents to hesitate to vaccinate? Thank you for the question, and you. Thank you for the question, and you rightly pointed out that a lot of there's evidence to suggest that a lot of parents are making the decisions around vaccines before the baby is born. After the baby is born, it's like a fast-moving train, and parents go through this extended jet lag. Um, and so, so before that, um, there's a lot of discussion happening, etc. And there are several reasons for this. For the first one is the big picture reason is that vaccines are a victim of their own success. And as the rates of vaccine-preventable diseases go down because of vaccines, successive cohorts of parents see and hear about real or perceived adverse events um, and not the disease. And what happens is that, that that mental calculus changes. And in that milieu, they, are several, they interact with several local factors. And in the U.S., for example, we have, due to that a sort of change, in the disease rates, which is a good thing, we have less appreciation of vaccine susceptibility and severity and more questions about vaccine safety. Yeah. And, and so in that context, focusing on not just childhood, but before the baby is born, we are working, for example, our uh, group is doing a randomized controlled trial in collaboration with the University of Colorado and Johns Hopkins, where we are, uh, you know, and this is uh, due to an investment, due to funding from the National Institute for uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, where are we looking at bringing together the best evidence and packaging it and seeing if that has an impact, not just maternal vaccination, but this intervention being performed in pregnancy leading to childhood vaccination rates uh, increase. And so the initial results from them are promising, but to come back to the idea that we need to continue to invest in the best science for vaccine behavior and communication as we do for vaccine safety and vaccine efficacy. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Chairman Alexander. Thank you all for your testimony. Mr. Lindenberger, what year in school are you? I am a senior in high school. When did you start doing the investigation and research on, on vaccination? So for my mother specifically, I mean, she would vocalize her views on vaccines uh, throughout my entire life. And it was a slow progression to start to see evidence as I would see people, uh, I suppose, uh, try and counterclaim with her and argue online. I would see that she would have these, uh, these, this backlash as she would share information. So on Facebook, she'd share a video and people would be like, that's incorrect, this is false. And so as a child, that intrigued me that people disagree with my mom and I slowly look into it over the course of multiple years. The second time you've used online in your answer, I want to add, does your mother get most of her information online? 
from what she's presented, yes, either through Facebook or through sites that use the social media platforms like Facebook and other, um, you, where, mainly Facebook. I mean, where do you get most of your information? From not Facebook. I mean, from CDC, uh, the World Health Organization, um, scientific journals, and also cited information from those uh, organizations like the Institute of Medicine. Um, trying my best to also look at accredited sources. I'd love to be a guest at Thanksgiving dinner at your house. That would be, <laughs> be a heck of a discussion everybody would have. I know that. Uh, Dr. Omar, thank you for being here, and thanks for the work that Emory does. Emory does a phenomenal job in, in uh, infectious diseases and all kinds of things like that. What, um, what currently, are there any things on the horizon that would join this, this group of people that we might want to be uh, immunized for later on? So there's uh, several exciting developments, and, and one of the big gaps in vaccine has been the fact that there is a gap of vulnerability between the baby is born and when we start vaccinating them. Um, and that's due to immunological reasons. And one of the more exciting developments in this area is the area of maternal immunization, where you vaccinate mom, and I had the privilege of being involved with some of those trials, et cetera, to protect not just the mother, but the baby as well. So there are vaccines against the respiratory syncytial virus, which is the biggest cause of viral pneumonia in the world that are on the horizon. So there's a variety of vaccines being developed. Uh, there is a vaccine uh, that is being developed against uh, group B streptococcus, et cetera. So there are several vaccines on the horizon. The field is expanding. Now, with those, with those uh, uh, vaccinations take place in the mother before the baby is delivered? Yes. So it transferred to the baby during the course of gestation? Yeah, exactly. And, and our first trial was, uh, had a name of Mother's Gift uh, ages ago. And I think it's an appropriate name for this kind of a strategy where you know, maternal antibodies protect the baby. You know, I've been to Africa with C CDC a number of times and seen your work, your, the work in the field that they do. I don't know of any organization that does a more for health care in the, our country than CDC does. How much do you use CDC for as a resource in your work at Emory? A, a lot. So CDC is a national treasure. Um, and the firefighting function that I talked about, they perform with the state and local health department, is somewhat unique. For example, the European CDC is relatively new and has a very narrow mandate. And people who have looked at the effectiveness of national public health agencies in Europe have clearly come out with, with the understanding that our CDC is very strong, and, and I'm not trying to put down any other country's public health agencies uh, because you know they are trying their best, but the kind of investments that have gone into uh, building this cooperative framework of the CDC being the premier technical public health agency but working closely with the state and local health uh, department has served us really well, including in this area. I don't think you're putting them down at all. In fact, to tell you the truth, it's the world's health care center at CDC, and we are lucky to have it in the United States of America, but the, the world considers it their health center, and they're doing a better job. CDC is doing a better job incubating CDCs in other countries now to replicate what they do in countries that are more developed and, and populated. So Absolutely. they're a great resource, great help, and great service. And I thank all of you for being here today. And Mr. Lindbergh, don't forget, I'd love to come to Thanksgiving dinner one day and just meet you and your mom. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, or Madam Chairman. Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Um, in 2015, this committee held a similar hearing to discuss the resurgence of vaccine preventable diseases in response to a multi-state measles outbreak. Our nation's vaccination program has saved lives by preventing and reducing the outbreak of vaccine preventable diseases like measles, which has one of the most effective vaccines. So I am troubled that we are here again facing another preventable outbreak in several states that has similarly been exacerbated by a surge of misinformation surrounding vaccine safety. Um, I believe we must do a better job to prioritize investments in cutting edge science and public education surrounding uh, vaccine safety. Um, younger children and those with compromised immune systems have a higher risk of measles complications. And um, with the breadth of misinformation uh, proliferating in the media and online about the science behind vaccines, Dr. Weissman and um, Dr. Is it Omer? Yes. Omer. Um, what role do state health departments play in arming community leaders like school officials and providers with accurate information and scientific resources on vaccine safety and as a follow-on 
um, what can Congress do to improve the public health education so we don't see another preventable outbreak in the future? Thank you for that uh, question. Yes, so uh, states and local health departments really are the leaders um, in communities around these health strategies um, to engage their communities around vaccine information. Um, they help provide the health education. They work with the school systems. They work with health care providers to make sure that health care providers have the information they need. It really takes a sort of coordinated effort. Um, and honestly, you know, that, that system's uh, crumbling. Uh, the sort of um, resources that are going into prevention um, in our state, local, tribal, um, and territorial health um, agencies has been decreasing. Um, and we're really not up to the task. For example, you know, I had a call with CDC a number of months ago, state health officials, we do this every uh, two weeks, and CDC was on the call talking about a hepatitis A um, outbreak um, that's occurring throughout the country in many um, communities. They're encouraging us to do proactive vaccination campaigns with homeless and injection drug users, which is where this is um, uh, being sought or being seen. Mm -hmm. I don't have the resources. I asked my staff what would a plan look like um, that. It would probably cost us $5 million. I don't have those resources. I don't have the staff that are there. That's very, very concerning um, to me. Um, and I forgot your second question. but How can Congress help? So uh, I think you may have answered Sort of helped it. answer that right <laughs> that's there. That's right. That's uh, right. Including, I think, investing in research around how do we, the social uh, uh, research around how is it we communicate with folks about vaccines and mm -hmm. then have a national campaign. Uh, we really need to get on this. So yeah, just to add to that, in addition to research uh, and, and investment in high quality research, I think the Congress can, uh, uh, Congress can work on making vaccine counseling reimbursable. So that's a specific tool that physicians can use at the periphery, at the front lines of these conversations that are happening every day. Then sort of take the blueprint that I mentioned that is already there, the, that, that was developed by the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, that has very specific science-based um, recommendations uh, to, to have that kind of uh, implementation uh, out there, uh, and to continue to support CDC's mission of these controlling outbreaks, et cetera. That shouldn't be taken for granted. And, and the last thing in this uh, stream of specific things is continue to prioritize the vaccine safety research enterprise that we have, which is not just a template for this country, uh, but uh, everywhere else as well. So it's, uh, having a robust vaccine safety system is not only a tool to maintain confidence in, in vaccines, mm -hmm. but it's just the right thing to do. Um, so, so these are some of the specific things uh, Congress and the federal government can do. Thank you. Uh, I have only a few seconds left. I'm going to ask a question. Maybe if we run out of time, you can uh, submit information for the record. But um, so, uh, I follow, of course, some of the advancements that happen in my state and some of the interesting things that are happening. Um, since 2007, a company called Flugen in Madison, Wisconsin, has been working to develop a more effective flu vaccine based on technology that was um, discovered and invented at the University of Wisconsin. As we've heard today, highly effective vaccines have played a critical role in advancing um, uh, public health around the world. And I think there's more that we can do to develop, uh, to support the development of better vaccines to protect individuals from an illness that results in literally thousands of deaths each year. Uh, Mr. Boyle, can you describe uh, why it's important for Congress to continue to support um, this uh, medical research that advances the development of more effective vaccines for common illnesses like the flu and specifically for vulnerable populations? Uh, sure, let me try. Uh, the, one of the challenges uh, that uh, I see when I uh, even think about my colleagues and friends uh, who uh, sometimes struggle with uh, whether to get the flu vaccine uh, is basic issues of fears of things like needles. They don't want to get a shot. They're scared of that. Uh, for that reason, um, I know that things like the flu mist and, and others are attractive. Uh, the problem is within our community, a live virus such as uh, that has been uh, used in the past is a problem. So 
we are a little bit torn in that uh, you know we want something to be easy and efficacious and something that's going to be widely adopted. But at the same time, we have to be concerned about those who are especially uh, undiagnosed. So there is uh, a little bit of a balance there and further uh, investigation to help understand what new technologies could be made to reduce the burden of getting a uh, vaccine, be it for the flu or anything more communicable, would be phenomenal. Uh, at the same time, we'll have to work with uh, the CDC uh, and others in order to balance out the needs of those who are actually uh, going to be affected uh, by that negatively. But we're all in it together, so the continued conversation and exploration is important. And we, uh, our community uh, and other immunocompromised communities would, I think, be delighted uh, to be part of those conversations. Thank you. D uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. For much of modern history, science and freedom have lived in relative harmony. Traditionally, as medical discoveries came about, like the smallpox or polio vaccine, antisepsis or antibiotics, the results were so overwhelming that over time the vast majority of the public accepted these advances voluntarily. In fact, innovations like the smallpox vaccine had to overcome initially great public prejudice. Dr. Zebedeo Boylston learned about the Middle Eastern technique from his uh, ser uh, servant for the famous pastor, Cotton Mathers. His first patient was actually his son, an incredibly brave choice. The consensus of the medical community, though, was entirely opposed to him at the time. The vaccine was a live vaccine, and as Dr. Boylston learned, about one in 50 of those inoculated would die from the vaccine. And yet, the death rate from smallpox was approximately 50%. The government did not mandate the vaccine, though, but within two generations, it was accepted enough that George Washington insisted that Martha be vaccinated with the smallpox vaccine before visiting him in the military camps. Today, though, instead of persuasion, many governments have taken to mandating a whole host of vaccines, including vaccines for non-lethal diseases. Sometimes these vaccine mandates have run amok when the, as when the government mandated a rotavirus vaccine that was later recalled because it was causing intestinal blockage in children. I'm not a fan of government coercion, yet given the choice, I do believe that the benefits of most vaccines vastly outweigh the risks. Yet it is wrong to say that there are no risks to vaccines. Even the government admits that children are sometimes injured by vaccines. Since 1988, over $4 billion has been paid out from the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Despite the government admitting to and paying $4 billion for vaccine injuries, no informed consent is used or required when you vaccinate your child. This may be the only medical procedure in today's medical world where an informed consent is not required. Now, proponents of mandatory government vaccination argue that parents who refuse to vaccinate, to vaccinate their children risk spreading these disease to the immunocompromised community. There doesn't seem to be enough evidence of this happening to be recorded as a statistic, but it could happen. But if the fear of this is valid, are we to find that next we'll be mandating flu vaccines? Between 12 and 56,000 people die from the flu or are said to die from the flu in America. And there's estimated to be a few hundred from measles. So I would guess that those who want to mandate measles will be after us on the flu next. Yet the current science only allows for educated guessing when it comes to the flu vaccine. Each year, before that year's flu vaccine is, or strain is known, the scientists put their best guess into that year's vaccine. Some years it's completely wrong. We vaccinate for the wrong strain of, uh, the wrong strain of, of, of flu vaccine. Yet five states already mandate flu vaccines. Is it really appropriate, appropriate to mandate a vaccine that more often than not vaccinates for the wrong flu strain? As we contemplate forcing parents to choose this or that vaccine, I think it's important to remember that force is not consistent with the American story, nor is force consi consistent with the liberty our forefathers sought when they came to America. I don't think you have to have one or the other, though. I'm not here to say don't vaccinate your kids. If this hearing is for persuasion, I'm all for the persuasion. I vaccinated myself. I vaccinated my kids. For myself and my children, I believe that the benefits of vaccines greatly outweigh the risks. But I still do not favor giving up on liberty for a false sense of security. Thank you. Do, do you yield back? Senator Warren. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we've heard today about how important vaccines are to preventing and controlling many diseases. And I want to zero in on one that we are battling right now in Massachusetts. Since last April, 318 outbreak-associated cases of acute hepatitis A virus have been reported in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hep A is a contagious virus that causes liver infection. Older children and adults who acquire the hepatitis A virus can experience a slew of incredibly unpleasant symptoms, fever, nausea, uh, and in rare cases, the virus can even lead to death. In Massachusetts, four people have already died since the outbreak began. Now, we didn't used to have a hepatitis A vaccine at all, but in 1995 and 96, the Food and Drug Administration approved two hepatitis A vaccines, and soon after, CDC recommended vaccination for certain populations, including routine vaccinations of children living in areas with elevated rates of the virus. Dr. McCullers, you study infectious diseases. What impact did the introduction of the hepatitis A vaccine have on the national rates of the virus? Well, thank you very much, Senator Warren. Yes, hepatitis A can be a very severe disease, in particular high-risk groups. The uh, vaccine that came out in the late 1990s is a very safe, very effective vaccine. And as we've increased vaccination rates, we've seen a tremendous decrease in the rate of the disease. We've seen more than a 50-fold decrease nationally over those years, primarily eliminating a lot of the disease in children as well as some of the foodborne outbreaks. But there's still a lot of public health work to do, as, you, as is illustrated by your current outbreak. So, so that's the question I want to ask. We, we developed the vaccine, the rate goes way down. So we now have a vaccine preventable virus here. Why are we seeing so many hepatitis A cases emerging now? Well, what you're seeing is the vaccines, uh, you know, administered in childhood. It's only been around for about 20 years. So if you're 21 years or older, you probably haven't had it. Now, okay. it is recommended that high risk groups such as, in, you know, recreational drug users, as is part of the problem in Massachusetts, be vaccinated. And we haven't gotten to all those groups yet. So efforts to really find the high risk individuals, which are well defined, and to get them the vaccine would help prevent these outbreaks in the future. Yeah. And this is part of what's happening in Massachusetts. We've been battling the opioid crisis for years, and hepatitis A is just another place we need to fight on this. But we are learning from this. Uh, just this past October, the same CDC committee whose recommendations in the 1990s helped the rates of the virus decline sharply added persons experiencing homelessness to the list of those who are recommended to get hepatitis A vaccine. I see you're all nodding, right? So in Massachusetts, our public health workers, our community health centers, and our jails have sprung into action to try to get the vaccine to those who are most at risk. Dr. Weissman, as Secretary of the Washington State Department of Health, you oversee your state's public health response what can we be doing to ensure that local public health officials have the resources they need to be able to do their work? Yes, thank you. So um, really, part of this is making sure that the Prevention Public Health Fund um, is funded um, and that we look at the funding to CDC. We've been asking uh, ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and, and local public health uh, uh, for increasing the CDC budget 22% uh, by um, fiscal year uh, 22. All right, so we're talking money now. We are talking we're money. We're talking money. <laughs> and whether it's a situation like hepatitis A outbreak in Massachusetts or the measles outbreak in Washington State, how do the preventive costs of a vaccine program compare to the containment and treatment costs of an outbreak? Well, in general, we do know that for about every dollar spent on vaccines, you save about 10. Um, so it's definitely a cost-effective intervention. Ah, good. So the more we do on the front end to ensure that everyone gets access to the vaccines, the less we'll see individuals contracting hepatitis A, measles, whooping cough, all of the other vaccine-preventable diseases. Um, this administration has repeatedly sought to cut the Prevention and Public Health Fund which supports key immunization programs, and they've continued their efforts to weaken the Medicaid program, which covers all of the recommended vaccines for children and for many adults as well. I am glad that 
most of my colleagues are on the same page about the importance of vaccines. Now let's make sure we're also on the same page about the importance of public health funding so people get access to those vaccines. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to go a little cross current here. And I want to state that um, the importance of vaccine in infants and young people uh, cannot be overstated. I, I, I understand that. Well, I want to talk about the seniors who uh, are also at increased risk of experiencing serious and life threatening effects of vaccine uh, preventable diseases. We have quite a few octogenarians uh, in the Senate that uh, get vaccinated, more especially with flu. Dr. Boyle, you touched on this with your um, reference to this topic on the effect of a herd immunity uh, syndrome, which I appreciate uh, particular settings in which adults and seniors are more susceptible to infectious diseases if they are not vaccinated. Um, I'd like to figure out if we can look for ways that federal programs can help by removing barriers to services like vaccines and uh, providing the right incentives for people to use them. And what procedural barriers exist to ensuring seniors have proper access to vaccines? Do we need more education seniors provide to overcome these challenges? I'm going to give you a personal illustration. A young lady, but she was in her 80s, but she was young. <laughs> um, she made sure that all six of her children got flu shots, and in turn, all of their grandchildren, and then that was a bunch of folks. And then yet, she got the flu in Kansas this uh, time around, bad, you know, bad, uh, just a very bad uh, flu season. And for some reason, she didn't get a flu shot. So here she is, a mother who has told her kids to get vaccinated and made sure it happened. And then in her own situation, she didn't get the flu shot along with her husband. We lost both. The sniffles became flu, the flu became serious, and we get into uh, pneumonia and we get into all sorts of other problems. And I'm not, not going to go into what kind of treatment they received. But they were very important folks, and they were pillars of their community, and they were still very active. I sometimes think that the octogenarian caucus and the, uh, well, in the Senate were known as potted plants. They were also known as chairman of the uh, uh, various committees around here. Dr. Omer, you've written about vaccine confidence, and I'm interested in how this applies to adults. In recent years, we've seen outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases in which unvaccinated adults are an important factor. CDC also noted that a drop in the immunization rate contributed to rise in the hospitalization and deaths uh, during the last flu season. I don't get it. I don't understand why in a period of your life when you would be obviously saying, I need a flu shot, and then respond to why you didn't do it, so well, we're just getting around to it. Uh, I don't know if any of you would like to offer any opinions. We're talking about young people all the time, but there are people who still contribute to this society, even though there is no bar graph after 80 or anything. We're just out there. Anybody want to comment? Dr. Omer? So thank you, Senator. And um, the story you narrated is not unique, unfortunately, in this country and, and throughout the world. The elderly are one of the highest risk groups for complications after influenza. Um, the vaccines uh, are s slightly less effective in the elderly, but that's the reason we need more of them to be vaccinated. And this is one of the gaps that I was talking about, that we don't have evidence base to communicate to several groups, including the elderly. And, and this is not a group that is um, actively opposed to vaccines. They have, you know, the concept of vaccines, and they have seen what infectious diseases can do. But the, at that time, when, when, you know, a lot of the discussion has revolved around childhood vaccines, we need evidence-based strategies to communicate 
to not just the elderly, but also to their health systems. The providers who deal with the elderly don't have, unfortunately, the muscle memory to talk about vaccines and to make it part of their routine clinical practices. Uh, um, it, there's a lot to be done, and, and, and thank you for highlighting that issue. Mr. Chairman, my time has uh, expired. I want you to know that we did not plan this, Dr. Omer and myself, uh, you know, before the committee uh, hearing, but he certainly hit the nail on the head. And uh, yeah, I think, I, I think it's an issue that we overlook. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. This has been a fascinating topic. Um, timely, uh, I noticed a, a yet another study has come out just in the last 24 hours, uh, a study dealing with a very significant longitudinal study of a big chunk of children in Denmark that also, again, demonstrates no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. And so it's a timely day to have this hearing. Um, I want to ask a question about, uh, begin with a question about vaccination shortages, which as a former governor um, worries me a lot. Um, the problems in the supply chain that could lead to shortages of important medications. In 2017, outbreaks of hepatitis A increased demand and led to constrained supplies of that vaccine. Many constituents have contacted my office about their inability to access the shingles vaccine, Shingrex. So last June, I joined a bipartisan group of members of this committee in a letter to Commissioner Gottlieb urging him to convene the Drug Shortage Task Force to develop a report on the root shortage of drug vaccines. I look forward to reading that report, and I think it may be on the verge of being published. I think the committee has completed the work, and it's very close to publication. It might be worthy of some committee consideration when it's done. Um, what more can we do, and I guess maybe I'll direct it specifically to Dr. Omer and Dr. Wiesman, what more could we do at the federal level to make sure there's an adequate supply of vaccines? Well, just uh, start out and then turn it to my colleague. Um, so one thing that we need to continue investing in vaccine research and figuring out new technologies for uh, producing vaccines. We use sort of egg technology, and it's a very long, uh, laborious process in many of these. So we have to uh, move towards new technologies, I think, around cell-based or recombinant um, vaccines so that we can produce them more quickly and assure the safety. Um, and it is a problem uh, with the vaccine shortages. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of my mentors uh, has said a few times that it's not a vaccine is in a vial that remains in a vial is 100 percent safe but zero percent effective <laughs> and so inventing a vaccine or developing a vaccine or licenses a vaccine is not sufficient mm -hmm. we need to have a stable supply of vaccines and that requires a a federal wide uh, thinking and response from regulation to working with uh, you know, our research uh, entities to say that there is a robust pipeline of new vaccines and there are multiple approaches. So infectious diseases uh, attack our uh, bodies through multiple mechanisms, therefore there are multiple vulnerabilities. So what it does is that it creates an intellectual marketplace of ideas so that if there's more than one strategy that we are focusing on at the science level, we have more likelihood of having multiple products that you know, compete with each other and, and have a, sort of give us more options as a country. Then working with manufacturers, um, sort of ensuring that we understand that there is a stable manufacturing pipeline. The third thing is, um, you know, sometimes in certain, especially in pandemics, et cetera, one policy intervention uh, is VARDA, which uh, invests in preparedness-related interventions. And, for example, some flu vaccines that would be required in a, in a pandemic, there it's in our interest to ensure a stable um, seasonal flu pipeline. And so there are in, in, in interventions and investments which are a little bit more direct that sort of straddle that divide between emerging and routine vaccination, et cetera. So it will require a, a nationwide, a, a national response, not just a federal response in the sense that sort of bringing in states and other partners as well. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Dr. McCullers, so maybe, maybe, maybe be quick because I have one more question. All right, maybe very quickly then. Uh, three quick issues. One is that these are for-profit companies generally that create the vaccines, and so having a, a federal buy that gives them some surety it will make them produce more, which will help the vaccine shortages. The second is we really have a problem, not so much with shortage often, but with maldistribution, so it becomes a logistics effort, and we could do better at that with at the local level being able to make sure every physician practice or 
hospital has that. And the third is really to reinforce the importance of the strategic national stockpile, which again right. keeps these vaccines in, in, in reserve when we might need them. Thank you. I'll just in my last half minute, Mr. Lindenberg, I just want to compliment you. You know, um, we revere Jefferson in Virginia, and one of the things that he said that still is so powerful is progress in government and all else depends upon the broadest possible diffusion of knowledge to the general population. He believed that the diffusion of knowledge and giving people knowledge would enable them to make the right decisions. Now, fake knowledge, misinformation, intentionally misleading information can also be disseminated. And in this social media age with the internet, um, the competition between the true and the valid and the fake and the dangerous, even the manipulated, um, by people who want to do us harm is very difficult. But I think it's interesting that, you know, probably both your mother and you uh, reached your conclusions because you had an internet and tools to do your own research. Uh, and so the difference between your mother and you were using some of the same tools and reaching different conclusions. But I applaud your critical thinking uh, skills and your willingness to share your story. Thank you. And I don't want to go over time. Uh, but just to comment on that very quickly, I think part of the uh, issue is being able to inform people about how to find good information because there with my mother it wasn't that she didn't have the information but she was manipulated into disbelieving it and so that's part of the attack which is that the CDC was made out to be a fraudulent group that was pushing vaccines for its own demand and that that's not the case and that the evidence that evidence proposed is, is genuine and so I just want to comment on that yeah uh, my turn um, um, let me give some color to what Senator Paul said. You may or may not know I'm a physician, and I've seen people who have not been vaccinated, who have required liver transplantation because they were not, and are who uh, ended up with terrible diseases because of no other reason than they just, for whatever reason, didn't understand vaccination was important. I think it's important to point out that even if flu shots are not completely effective, they do mitigate. They do mitigate, and so there is a cross benefit that will decrease the severity, number one. Number two, hospitals commonly require their employees to be immunized because they understand that herd immunity is important. And if the nurse's aide is not immunized, she can be a typhoid Mary, if you will, bringing disease to many who are immunocompromised, as Mr. Boyle points out. And as regards re, uh, the, the federal government requiring, there is a federal statute requiring that vaccine information statements should be given. That is a federal requirement. And in the name of liberty, we should rely, therefore, upon states and localities to make a further requirement, but they typically do require an informed consent. So that's important to know not to be misled by, uh, uh, not to be misled regarding that. Secondly, I think, or next, I think we should point out that in terms of a requirement, the requirement is just that you cannot enter school unless you're vaccinated. Now, if you're such a believer in liberty that you do not wish to be vaccinated, then there should be a consequence and that is that you cannot infect other people. Mr. Boyle, if your child is born with immunodeficiency and someone comes to your school who is not vaccinated and the lack of herd immunity means that your child, who no fault of their own, cannot be immune, is it a victimless crime that somebody doesn't get vaccinated and your child dies? I mean, my gosh, you're the guy who's representing those people who, whatever reason the vaccine doesn't work or they're particularly susceptible. Now, Dr. Weissman, I seem to remember a particularly tragic case in Washington State from about six years ago of a child who's immunocompromised on steroids, chemotherapy for cancer, and someone brought measles to the school, and I think I remember that child died. Do I remember that correctly? Um, if we're talking the same child, yes, died a number of years later from a follow-up um, reaction. Now, so the parent has had the child vaccinated, but now she's on cancer chemotherapy and she's immunocompromised and she is in school thinking that she can uh, be a normal child even though she's on cancer chemotherapy. But because someone else has made a decision not to vaccinate their child, her child dies. Now, if you believe in liberty, that's fine. Don't get it immunized. But I don't think you need to necessarily expose others to disease. Dr. McCullers. Um, uh, tell me, you're in a state, you mentioned a practice where you have people from three different states. And hats off to Mississippi, they always have the highest immunization rate. Uh, you didn't elaborate. What are the differences between the patients from these three, three different states in terms of, okay, Mississippi is always immunized, you imply that maybe Tennessee and Arkansas is not. 
Right, so Mississippi does not allow any non-medical exemptions, and they have nearly a 100% rate of immunization at school entry. They pay a lot of attention to it. Tennessee's in the middle. They allow religious exemptions, but not philosophical exemptions. In Tennessee, we have about a 97% vaccination rate at kindergarten entry, but we've seen the rate of non-medical exemptions uh, under, the religious, uh, under the religious exemption triple in the last 10 years, so you can predict where that's going. Arkansas, on the other hand, allows both religious and philosophical exemptions, and has a rate that's around 93 to 94% below the level for community immunity. And what state do you see the most vaccine-preventable diseases nonetheless presenting themselves? Well, all of these are rare, we, and we see them from all the, you know, we see things from all the states. Tennessee, we get about one a year measles case, always imported from um, outside the United States. So we have an adequate herd immunity that would still protect even if people are coming in and bringing another disease. To this point, you know, the problem is, as you've seen in California and Oregon and Washington, is that there are pockets where it's low, and it could happen easily in Tennessee next week. Even though we're 97 percent, there's plenty of communities that are below that level, and we might see the outbreak in that community. Now, Mr. Lindenberger, so obviously we have a bunch of docs or people who are, you know, I can't help but notice that your beard is not as heavy as the other people's. So this is not um, total, uh, you don't have to be an MD or a PhD or a Master's of Public Health to understand these issues, correct? Correct. So you just need to bring a critical faculty to it and look at it and understand it's not just the individual who's affected, but it is the individual whom the person goes to school with, correct? And as, I, as I've stated before, my decision to get vaccinated was based on the health and safety of myself and other people. And I approached my f family physician, spoke to her. She uh, encouraged me to get vaccinated. And even at school, I was told I wouldn't be able to attend if I did not get my vaccines, but was opted out. And so my school viewed me as a health threat. And so that, for me, also pushed me to look further into getting my vaccines despite my mother's beliefs, because I saw the threat that was being imposed. I'm out of time. Although I'm the chair, I will nonetheless defer to myself. <laughs> but, I, but I thank you very much. And Mr. Lindenberger, thank you for caring for the people you went to school with as much as you cared for yourself. Thank you. Uh, I yield my time. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Murray, for having this hearing. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I had the great good fortune of having a grandfather who was a pediatrician, and he practiced medicine from 1921 to about 1985. Uh, and my childhood was filled with his accounts of the changes that he saw on the medical landscape over the course of his career. Uh, I still remember him describing what it was like to see somebody suffer from lockjaw, which is tetanus. Um, the jaw locks, the swallowing stops, the breathing stops, the muscle spasm. And his talking about what a difference it made when the tetanus vaccine became available. I remember my mother, who had three children, the youngest one born in 1960, remarking during my childhood that now that there was a vaccine against rubella, German measles, pregnant women didn't have to worry nearly as much about going out of their house during pregnancy, accidentally contracting German measles, which could be so damaging to the fetus. So I think it is incumbent on all of us to remember these stories because to a number, a number of you have made the point that without this experience of what these diseases actually do and mean, uh, we have gotten less vigilant as a society about the importance of this, um, importance of vaccinations. Um, Dr. Omar, I wanted to follow up with you. You talked about the importance of uh, work you're doing on helping pregnant women get vaccinated. Um, we know that in the United States, almost all vaccines are administered to infants once they are at least two months old. So for the first two months of their lives, infants rely on the antibodies of their mothers, uh, the antibodies that moms transfer during pregnancy to protect them from preventable diseases or viruses such as the flu. We know that vaccines like the flu vaccine currently available, not necessarily the new ones you're working on, are critical for pregnant women and their babies. And we know that these populations face a greater risk of complications due to the flu, including premature birth delivery, hospitalization, or in severe cases, death. But astonishingly, only about half of women receive the flu vaccine during pregnancy. With infant and mortality rates reaching startling numbers in the United States in recent years, it's absolutely critical that we take basic steps to help protect women and babies during pregnancy and childbirth. 
Dr. Omar, what do you think is the leading cause for the low number of vaccinated pregnant women, and what can we do moving forward to help improve these numbers and keep mothers and babies safe? So th there are several causes, and of th there are only few women who are outright opposed to vaccines, and there's this huge gap, this huge group, which is the fence-sitter group. Right. And so that's an opportunity to persuade, to educate, to have these meaningful conversations. So in terms of how to intervene, so we proposed a model called the P3 model. Uh, it's a, a practice provider and patient. We changed it to at the third P to pregnant women because uh, pregnancy is not a pathology. Right. Uh, it's a very physiological state uh, yep. uh, to be in. And we advocate for and we are evaluating strategies and there's emerging evidence that there, there is promise to this strategy to work with the practice, for example, things like um, standing orders. Um, which uh, use behavioral economics type concepts to nudge a the, uh, the, uh, practice into vaccinating, working on the supply side issues, working on physician communications, and persuading pregnant women. In terms of the specific reasons, there is uh, this um, uh, focus on the baby. And so we have found, this is one of the other universal yeah. things, that mothers are both motivated to protect the baby and scared to harm the baby. Right. And as we generate safety evidence, which is very robust for influenza vaccine, we need to find better ways and evidence-based ways, as, as I alluded to, to communicate to pregnant women as well. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and maybe what I'll do then, just with my limited time, is also ask Dr. McCullers, as a practitioner, um, I'm curious about uh, how you go about communicating uh, with parents who are having vaccination hesitancy. Among parents who choose not to vaccinate their children, what's their most common reason? And moving forward, what can we do to really help ensure that parents are educated about the importance of vaccinations? Yeah, it's interesting. Ten years ago, there was one common reason, and that was the fear of autism and these bad things. Right now, there's really a polyglot of reasons. They have all sorts of different minor concerns that come up. And so the most important thing for a pediatrician to do or a family practitioner or an OB is listen. Yeah. understand, respect what those concerns are because they're different for every person. Right. And then really individualize how you're going to approach that and what education you're going to give because there are a lot of concerns that are floating around out there and we need to have an individualized message. So it's, it's that rapport between the patient and the physician. And a sharing of best practices I would expect among professionals about how to do this. Absolutely. Directed at what their particular concern is right. and what that best practice is. Thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Murray, and thanks all of you for being here. I really appreciate it. So in 2017, um, my home state of Minnesota experienced um, uh, the largest measles outbreak that we had seen since 1990. And between March and August of that year, we had um, 75 cases of measles and 21 related hospitalizations. And of course, our State Department of Health, which is really um, a, a a model for great departments of health um, stepped in and did a really remarkable job working with children's hospitals in Hennepin County and a whole range of other, of other partners. Um, so, Dr. Wiesman, I know you've been dealing with this in Washington and um, um, some of my colleagues have gotten at this, but could you just tell us, summarize for us, like how best the federal government can be a good partner as state departments of health are dealing with these outbreaks? Great. Well, first of all, um, I would say that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is amazing. Uh, they have uh, lent us uh, their technical experts uh, around measles and have actually sent people out to our state, uh, in part based on our request. Um, so that's incredibly important. Um, I think, again, we need to be looking at um, how is it we get to the, as the CDC director said in my state last week, how do we get to the hearts and minds of people around um, yeah. vaccines and to not put science on the shelf? We need to have this uh, national conversation and national campaign that um, is based on evidence and, and that we develop the evidence on how to best uh, communicate. 
Um, it is a response effort and it happens at the local level. I think we need to remember that, which means we've got to fund our local health departments um, adequately so they have the staff resources to be able to respond, uh, but actually, frankly, also to prevent these. Work with communities in advance, these pockets of communities that have these unvaccinated um, right. folks. So this gets to another question related, which is that in Minnesota, when we saw this measles outbreak, we saw some communities that were disproportionately affected, and there was an order to communicate and, and, and hear well the concerns and the issues in these communities. It was important that we had culturally competent, specific kinds of outreach. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen that are good models in that area? Right, well, um, I think the good model is having folks on your staff who are actually culturally diverse, um, who uh, know these communities um, inside and out uh, as being really important. So we have to have employees who reflect the face of the community. And that's a challenge for a lot of us, and we are not there. Um, and then I think it's really this uh, community um, development outreach work, building the relationships with informal leaders in communities, whether they be church leaders, whether they be elders in tribal communities, whatever, those trusted folks there that people listen to um, and engage them um, in health uh, promotion work. Thank you, thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on that specific question of how we can have culturally um, um, connected outreach in this area? Yeah. If I may add, uh, yes, that, that specific example was over. stood out for, for many of us because that community was targeted for misinformation. Right. Um, there were several visits uh, by folks who are not particularly enthusiastic about vaccines. Um, and so the response is also an example of how to engage communities. So the Children's Hospital, not just the health department, but, but other partners came together and worked with the community itself um, and to bring up the, the, the rates of vaccination. They have the tools which are evidence-based, and one of the evidence-based tools is that you have a disease salience-based approach. And you don't just talk about the vaccine, but you talk about the, vac uh, the disease itself, mm -hmm. because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lindenberger, did you want to say add to this? Uh, so I would also add that when we're talking about a diverse group of people also addressing um, specific uh, communities, um, one thing I would address in a biased level, at least, is that for young people, especially moving into adulthood with their decisions in me on a medical level, um, is extremely important because once you become of age, I, at least for me, most of my friends didn't even understand that they could get vaccinated despite their parents' wishes. And once you move into living on your own and starting your career, still that, that push of explaining to young people that vaccines are important is especially important. So I would Thank just add you. that. Thank you. Mr. Boyle. Uh, if I may, um, just to add on to that, as we're talking about uh, the cultural issues here, one of the things that I've found, uh, while I, I love most of the, what the CDC and others uh, provide, one of the pieces of the communication that I find missing are stories. Uh, there is precious little that really connects uh, the person if they, if they are not swayed by facts to the needs. And so if someone's tia or auntie uh, you know, is, uh, is receiving chemotherapy and is immunocompromised, tying it back to the, the personal in their community, I think is a piece that uh, at least I have not seen uh, much. And I think that as we talk about these sort of campaigns and needed next steps, that's another layer to add in to everything else that needs to happen. Thank you. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you and Dr. Cassidy and Ranking Member Murray for uh, presiding over this hearing. It's an important set of issues. I want to start with Mr. Lindenberger. <clears throat> I'd like to be able to think that or believe that when I was, um, you're a senior in high school now, I'd like to be able to believe at that age I could do what you've done today. <laughs> Um, I think the answer is probably no. There may be some members of the committee that could have, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> Second, I wanted to say I know how difficult this would be no, ma no matter what age you are, what station in life, because it's a difficult topic and you're, you also have uh, a personal story to tell, which is difficult to even tell in private and let alone in a public setting. Thirdly, you've done something that we don't often do in Washington. This is a town where People are pretty good at demonizing and dividing, uh, and we're really experts at being categorical that someone who disagrees with us is always bad. Um, you've been able to be very clear about where you stand and what you believe and bear witness to the truth without being categorical and without demonizing. So that's um, not only helpful for this topic, but it's instructive for the rest of us here in both parties and both houses. I hope people are listening. 
I wanted to ask you if, if you could share additional ideas about um, that you have developed over because of the experience you've had as to how to effectively reach out to parents and address their concerns so that the, they are confident in the advice that their doctors, advice of their doctors, and don't hesitate to have their children immunized. Of course, and I thank, know you've spoken yes. to this a little bit already. Yes, thank you for that question, actually, because there's a really important distinction that needs to be make, made between the information provided, as we discussed earlier, where people don't resonate well with information and data numbers, and, and, and they resonate better with stories. You see that with a lot of the anti-vaccine community, that a large portion of the foundation that they build to communicate with parents is on a very anecdotal level, sharing stories and uh, experiences. And that speaks volumes to people because, at least for even my family, my mom would reaffirm that her position was correct because she knows people and she's seen stories. But correlation is e equal causation, and we don't know a lot of factors involved. But even though I could say that, that still doesn't resonate. And so I've seen that a large portion of what we have missed, and to address your question you know, even more accurately, just the stories of people suffering from preventable diseases, the stories of preventable diseases ravaging uh, countries and nations. Uh, is extremely important, and the side effects and complications that these diseases impose. Even when talking about measles, there's a huge um, misinformed belief that measles isn't a dangerous disease that spreads around the anti-vaccine community, but measles is one of the biggest killers of young infants because of the, the dangers it imposes to young children. You see that upwards of 80% like of, of measles death in certain statistics are, are from children five and under. And so when you convince parents that not information is incorrect, but that their children are at risk, that's a much more... Um, substantial way to cause people to change their minds. Thank you. That's helpful. And I appreciate your testimony. And I know we're a little low on time. I'll just ask one more. Dr. McCullers, I wanted to get to the issue of prevention, which we repeat over and over again as the best cure. We know that vaccines provide the best type of prevention, not only for the individual, but for the, the population by way of herd immunity, as we've heard so often today. I guess my question for you, though, is um, can you describe, based upon your own experience, your own work, your own research, um, the, the, both in terms of your experience in research and in patient care, uh, what are some of the both symptoms and the outcomes of typical vaccine-preventable diseases for children and adults? So there, there's a wide spectrum depending on which disease you're talking about. Obviously, these are diseases that cause severe disease and death, or they wouldn't have been targeted 50 years ago for, you know, and longer ago for elimination. I think you know, one of the things that, as physicians and as providers, that we don't realize really how bad it was. You know, I trained at a time where Haemophilus B meningitis was a scourge, where varicella, every kid got varicella and came in with chicken pox. And I can remember working in the emergency department and seeing three or four kids a night coming in almost comatose and with brain damage and some dying. That vaccine came in while I was in my pediatric residency and the disease disappeared overnight. And so trainees now don't see that and don't understand just how bad these vaccine preventable diseases are because they've never experienced Maybe them Maybe because firsthand. of advancements. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I think that's that, that education piece and, and you know, the ability to, to really spread that message that this really were terrible things that are, and it's good that they're eliminated, that we have these vaccines is important. Thanks. And I'll have more questions for the panel. We want to thank everyone for being here. I think everyone. Yes, thank you. I thank everyone for participating. Uh, Ranking Member Murray, thank you. Um, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days. Members may submit additional information for the record within that time if they would like. Thanks for being here. The committee stands adjourned.
So, so we can go out which way? This way? Alright, she's gonna grab our pets.